this talk is, well, there's lots of words, you know, log4j, shell thing, blah, blah. Um, I'm going to take you through a little bit about log4j because it's an exa exciting example of how not to do things. Uh, but mostly I'm going to take you through a bunch of other stuff to do with security and bad guys and then a whole bunch of things about what we could do. Uh, so there are some consequences coming down the pipe that as developers you should be aware of and I'm going to cover those uh, and try and bring it all together. So hopefully you can walk away here feeling a little bit more informed and also understanding more about what your responsibilities are in what's going to be the new world of software development. Right, so this is me. And if you were here this morning, it hasn't changed. I do, used to do Java. I used to do JVMs. I was an engineer, uh, did lots of that, uh, worked on all sorts of open source projects, and even ran a DevOps team. I used to run a European DevOps team for IBM in the UK. Sounds a bit weird, but that's what we did. And so I've been a dev developer, a DevOps person, et cetera. When I was a developer, I really didn't pay much attention to security because we don't, do we? The security is somebody else's problem, right? But when I took over a DevOps team, suddenly security became almost the most important thing. Sometimes it was more than the most important thing. It was the most critical, urgent thing, okay? So I want to talk to you about how you as a developer need to think about how you do development at a very high level and hopefully get to change you to change your mind. Um, oh, sorry, I've got this twice. Um, to talk about why you as a developer need to think differently about how you behave. So let's start with the bad guys. Let's talk about why it is that I'm here talking to you and why you should pay attention. There's lots of conceptions that bad guys sit in bedrooms and hack FBI and Uber and whatever, right? And they do it for fun, though not necessarily for your fun, they do it for their fun, right? It's not like that at all. Let's talk to numbers. 2016, six years ago, was sort of about when I started talking about cybersecurity and cybercrime. And that's a point where the value of cybercrime became more than the value of the illicit drug trade, i.e. the bad guys made more money out of cyber attacks than they were making out of selling, moving illicit drugs, okay? $450 billion a year, okay? Or $14,000 a second, or the, the, or the same as buying 50 Nimitz-class aircraft carriers, right? That's how much they were making in 2016. So now, 2020, let's roll forward. What the numbers? Okay, I'm glad you're all sitting down. Let's go through the numbers. They now make $6 trillion a year. That's the same as $200,000 a second, or more amazingly, the same as 620 Nimitz class carriers. Okay, that's an enormous amount of money. And if you wanna make it even more scary, Here's a list of countries by their GDP, how much you know, money they bring in. And if cybercrime was a country, well look, it would be the third biggest country in terms of GDP. Just think about that, right? That is the driver, and it's gonna get worse. Six trillion dollars. You just can't imagine that amount of money, can you? And of course, one of the reasons this is growing is because it's easy, right? Because as human beings, for some reason, we think that if the threat is further away, it's less risky. And in physical terms, that's true. You know, you're sitting here and a bad thing is happening on the side of the country. 
you're not at risk because it's over there. And we apply that to the internet for some weird reason. So we think that if the bad guys are in some faraway country, that the risk is less. But of course, that's not true, is it? Right? There's no distance in the internet. The bad guys live next door, effectively. And the only thing between them and you is software. The stuff they're hacking. That's all that keeps you safe, is software. Right? So let's talk about software. Uh, this is where the Log4Shell comes in. Who's heard of Log4Shell? Uh, okay. Sorry. Okay, right. I'm just trying. Are there people here, people here who have not heard of Log4Shell? Or Log... Okay. Cool. Okay. Well, we're going to go through it anyway. Right. So, 9th of December last year, I'm talking to a colleague of mine who is a cyber journalist. He reports on all these issues. And I'm going, all you ever give me is Python ones and Node ones. And have you got something GC in the Java space? And he's going, ah, no, we'll never get one of those. Next day, Log4J turns up. Suddenly, we have this Log4J problem. And it gets more and more press. It ends up on TV because it's becoming, you know, see, we're seeing how bad it is. Right? It gets reports from uh, government organizations saying this is really bad. Right? Uh, even the White House perks up and says, this is really, really bad. We need to do something about this. Because ultimately, we think actually it turns out that maybe the log4j, log4shell vulnerability has, is the worst one we know ever. The worst being easiest to exploit and the ability to give the bad guys the things that they really want to do, which is full access, the ability to run arbitrary code on your systems. Right? That's like the big score. Right? And even worse, this thing had been around for a long time, 2014, the particular challenge, the, the code changes that made it that dangerous were made. The reason I put this here is because this is a great example of what, how developers behave and also, more importantly, just also how vulnerabilities evolve. And we're going to talk about those in more details. Right. Right. So it's been around since 2014. Let's talk a bit about the details, because it's important to understand with all vulnerabilities that vulnerabilities aren't smoking guns. There's not a big thing that says, this, there's no comments that says, this is a really bad thing. We mustn't do this, but we do it anyway. It's always a combination of things. So you know Log4j, everybody uses Logger. You have some logging entries in your code, and then you create a logger, and then you have in the lines at the bottom, you log stuff whatever it is you need to log. And that turns up in the log. That's what it's for, isn't it? You have logging instructions to put data into the log. And because logging is for diagnostic purposes, we want to make sure that whatever data we're going to log is as, is as unchanged as possible. We get data in from somewhere, we want to record it because it's going to tell us when we're diagnosing the problem which way our code went, right? So it has to be as is. The other thing that Log4j gives us is some help because when you're writing logging, you might need to know things like what version of Java am I running on or what platform am I running on because you may be, your application may be something that other people are using. And so for diagnostic purposes, you might want to know what version of Java you're running on. So rather than have to do system.get properties, log4j says, no, yeah, I've got these special versions, the dollar sys, and that lets you short circuit it. You don't have to do the heavy lifting. You just put those in the logger uh, in the format, and it just happens. It gets interpreted, you get data. Right? which is why you get you know, the line at the bottom. These things are called lookups, and there are a lot of them, because over time, Log4j has been extended 
to include not just asking for system properties, but also environmental valve properties, maybe asking for how Log4j is configured, and a whole bunch of others. So Log4j is a very powerful system, and it's grown like that. And we've got more to say as well, because in 2014, JNDI lookup got added for a very reasonable reason. If you're, if, if you're reporting config, config information and you, want, you have a tool that will do it easily for you, so system properties, environmental variables, well, it turns out there are config information that gets stored in JNDI databases and people wanted to record those in a nice, easy manner. Nothing wrong with that. Maybe a bit of an overkill, but it was in the spirit of Log4j. But when that happens, nobody realized that dragging in, with dragging in JNDI, you also pulled in those other things that JNDI can deal with, like LDAP and RMI and DNS, right? And you're, if you've paid any attention to Log4j, you know it's the JNDI LDAP type thing that was the Achilles heel that broke everything. And we're not finished there. There's one more thing about Log4j that made it a godsend to, bad, to the um, bad guys. And that is, is that these lookup values are recursive. So Log4j will take one, whatever it may be, and expand it by asking the lookup to do its stuff and you get some data back. And if the result contains a valid lookup, it'll do it again and again and again, right? Okay, so that, all these things combined meant that Log4j became this enormous weapon, right? It let you run arbitrary code, and you know that all it took was somebody to force your system to log something that was in the right format, and then they could exploit all these capabilities. They could do JNDI calls. Um, they could extract data from your systems, right? So loads of stuff you could do. That's another talk, all right? So if you take all that capability, way more than was ever in Vigis when we tried to do logging, you know, all these extras, and the fact that you want to write this stuff as is, so you're, you're predisposed to take data in and record it, well, you take all that, you add the bad guys, and then within four days of all this, <laughs> the world is being probed for log4j vulnerabilities, right? And all sorts of clever ways of making use of this were created and expanded. And it was an exciting time, wasn't it? Many of us spent, thought that they were going to spend Christmas, you know, with their families, and many of them found themselves trying to figure out how they could find out whether they had log4j in their system. Because another reason for me putting this up is, is that what this exposed to us all was that actually we're not very good at this. And that developers assume that somebody knows what they're doing in terms of managing this stuff. And that there's some IT group folk that manage all this stuff for you. And that it's not a problem. And it turns out that IT guys use tools that do things but they don't understand whether those tools are good enough because they don't understand how Java works and, and where log4j could be hidden. In a, it might not be in a dependency, it might be a fat jar, it might be pulled out. The, the bad classes may have been taken out and put somewhere else. So this exposed to us the fact that developers, us, have a vision that our somebody else is fixing a problem and those people may or may not think they're fixing it, but they don't actually understand what they're asking of the vendors they're, buying, they're getting tools from, right? And we know this is the case because if you go to sonotype.com, there's a tab you can go find, which will tell you the latest status of Log4j downloads. So here we are, almost a year later, 33% of the, of the downloads of a Log4j version from Maven Central is of a bad version, one with this vulnerability in. We as developers are culpable for this for multiple reasons, and I'll go through some of them, right? 
But we make assumptions that somebody else is protecting us, and those people are relying on tools that they are not making sure to do the right thing, because they're going, a lot of them just want to tick, right? But actually, they trust that the vendors they're getting these tools from know what they're doing, and sometimes they don't. And the net is that still 33% of downloads of Log4J a year later are still vulnerable versions. Really scary, don't you think? Right, let's move on. Bad, part three, bad, new bad guys. So, okay, so loads of money being made. Developers not really paying attention. Uh, the tools we use not necessarily being the best they could do. Can it get any worse? Oh, yeah. So there are still all these things going on. There are still all these botnets trying to get into your system. There are still people trying to steal your data. There's still people trying to hold your data to ransom. There are still people trying to steal your CPU to do Bitcoin mining. All that's still going on. Now there's a lot more. Now there are people trying to get into the open source projects of the dependencies that you're using. Now there are people trying to create fake versions of packages. Uh, so uh, if you're in the Python space or the Node space, it's a traumatic time to be because it's very easy to get fake packages installed. In the Maven space, the Java space, it's harder because you have to, you have rules in terms of putting stuff on Maven Central. But effectively, the idea is every time they can figure out, for instance, that you have some internal package. They can get the name for that, and they can get it on the public repo. Then, you're, the, then the download process tends to be that you go to public first. And suddenly, people are pulling down. You're not pulling down the version that you thought you were pulling down. You're pulling down a fake version. And you know about um, sometimes you might type, type the name wrong. And if you type the name wrong, you would expect there to be a failure because that package doesn't exist. Bad guys like creating packages that have the same typo in it, and you'll hit that instead. You won't realize that you made a typo. You've now got bad code coming into your system, right? This is what's going on. And the reason this is going on is because of this wonderful new word, well, not new, cyber warfare. We had a bunch of people who were trying to get into your systems for the money. Now you have a bunch of people trying to get into your systems because of other reasons. And we'll talk about those in a second. So they're motivated differently. They like the money, by mind you. They still want the money from you. They are much more professional. Right? Well, generally more professional. Definitely well-funded because they're funded by nation states to do this. Right? And because of what they're trying to achieve, which we'll go in that second, they are very different in their approach to attack you. They're not drive-by. They're not going after you because you left the window open and you're more vulnerable than somebody else. They're going after your systems for very, very specific reasons. Okay. And everyone is at risk. And I mean, individuals, you could be at risk because you know something about some system um, and everyone state, political bullies, you name, is getting into this act. You can begin to see why, and we'll talk more in detail about why, but basically everybody is waking up to the fact that they can use cybercrime techniques to attack people's systems. Okay? And they want all this stuff from you. It's, I can't express enough just how scary, you should, scary this is. Because Log4J has shown you that we tend to over-engineer things without thinking about security implications. The tooling we use is not good enough to detect a lot of the usage of these vulnerable systems. And now we have people who are going to the next level of trying to exploit all that, not just for money, but for other purposes. Right? And it's all through this thing called a supply chain. You will hear the term software supply chain more and more as time goes on because it is about relationships between software. Right? And we're all part of software supply chains. Right? If you, well, look, here's the slide. 
if you think about it as a supply chain, it's taking things in, giving things out. So you consume code, you give out binaries, um, you might just bring in dependencies. You're consuming somebody else. You may publish binaries. You may be part of an open source project. Right? You may be calling APIs. You may be using particular tools. They're all part of your supply chain because you use a compiler. Where does the compiler come from? It comes from somebody else. Where does the operating system? It comes from somebody else. You're, you're often at the end of a supply chain for software, but often you're also at the, in the middle of it because you're giving software out. And what the bad guys want to do in this instance is getting to your systems, right? They want to get into uh, your supply systems, that whether you run a hotel, whether you're a bank, whether you do, uh, I don't know, whether you do video services, whatever you do. Software is in, we, none of us are here in this room without software, right? And we all use software to get here one way or the other you use software to get here. And the fact is, we're using software now for me to communicate. So you imagine the value of being able to get into somebody's software supply chain and disrupt it. So obvious things like uh, um, heating, uh, gas, uh, transport, pharmaceuticals, supermarkets, train stations, you name it. The aim is get in there and then manipulate or terminate. Sometimes they're doing this for long-term purposes because at some time in the future, it may be that we want to uh, terminate your ability to deliver ammunition. Or more likely, and this is what's more likely and is sort of beginning to be realized now, is it doesn't have to happen in wartime. It can happen now because I can affect your economy. What happens if I get into your system and I switch the addresses of a delivery. Tiny thing, but it causes difficulties. It causes complaints. You know, what happens if I manage to stop all the milk being delivered to a supermarket for one day? You, know, you see, these small things can be made to impact your economy. And there you can see why suddenly everybody's waking up to the fact that this is all real and has enormous potential, right? Weaponized cybercrime, cyber warfare, is the new reality. It is emerging now, and it's been quietly building, but now we're beginning to see that it's suddenly surging. Uh, Cenotype keeps track of supply chains, because it's our business, and recently we can work out the different types of attack, and you can see that last year, the number of what would be considered to be supply chain attacks went up by 650%. No spoilers to tell you that this year you're going to see similar numbers because it is such an important activity. And it means, uh, who's heard of zero-day windows? Anybody heard of zero-day windows as far as CVEs are concerned? Okay. How long does it take you from... Um, uh, how long do you have from a vulnerability being reported to you to you fixing it. How long, how, how long is the window before the bad guys will come probing you? Well, way back it used to be, you can see 2006 used to be 45 days, right? Uh, log for shell showed us that basically there is no zero, there is no zero day window. You have no time. When a vulnerability is reported, it's already been exploited. And worse than that, we now know that the people who are finding the exploits, the bug hunters, are in, in some instances being paid very large amounts of money to not report the bug because it's such a wonderful weapon for one of these things. Yeah. If you start categorizing negative territory, yeah. Okay, so how, if we went into negative numbers, what would the number look like? Well, if you take log for j log for shell, um, we were talking, what, six years? So, yeah, could be any number. I, it's a very good question. I, I haven't thought about it, but basically um, months, years. 
Yeah, two orders of magnitude bigger. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, aha, good news. If your software is everywhere, and the uh, things I'm talking about aren't just um, attacks in the Java space, no, no, it's attack everywhere, because software is everywhere. If you've got software in your car, what happens if I can affect it to, I don't know, use more fuel or not start at traffic lights? Can you imagine the chaos? And this is all real. This is all turning up. Right? And it's not drive just drive-by. I need to impress this. Where drive-by is the idea that you just happen to be unlucky. Because this is state-oriented, and this is focused. They're looking at people, different organizations. So this was from last year, some guesses as to the sort of um, who's most likely to get attacked. It's a factor of importance, and it's also a factor of how easy it can be. Right? So if you're in one of these groups, or you provide software to one of these groups, then you could easily be high up on the list. Right? It gets worse. Okay, because it isn't just targeting industries, it's also going up the chain. So we're now looking at um, open source, right? Look, most of us use open source. Applications that we build, the majority of it is open source. Like with the, the numbers of, you know, like 90%. So you have your application, you have a bunch of dependencies, that's your application, right? And the amount of open source is, that is being created is just growing. Right? Enormous um, extension of the number of classes and Python code and Node code. You know, but open source is just it's just growing and growing and growing. They reckon by 2025 there could be 20 trillion downloads a year of open source. 20 trillion downloads. The world runs on open source software. And where it used to be that the bad guys would go and wait and search for vulnerabilities, which is cool, you know, that's, that's, what they're, that's part of the process, they're now making their own. So you will see these words, typo squatting, uh, dependency confusion. These are terms for different types of attack, but they're also after your open source project. They're open after how you do your builds. So if you have an open source project and you've got a build process, Mm, that's great. Can they get into your build process? Can they get at the end piece? Because if they can get at the end piece of the build, maybe they can add some malware. So they'll target that. But they'll also target your code as well. Right? So those dependencies that we talked about, the other way of looking at it is that they're looking for weaknesses. Sure, they're looking for ways in. But they're adding their own. They're looking for anywhere. Can they get into compilers? Can they get into tools? Can they get into platforms? Can they get into runtimes? And they're not designed to be visible. These are stealth. Because at some point, they'll want to set them off, but not necessarily immediately. So we have this situation where they're now beginning to target the open source projects of the dependencies that you're using. Right, and there are so many ways we could talk, spend a whole day talking about how they get in there, but you've got to understand that they are now an active target. So the dependencies that you take down, and we scan for vulnerabilities. That's one level. Now there's another level. Bad guys are trying to get into the open source projects. Oof. Right. Well, I have a few minutes left. Let's talk about what we're doing to make this go away, because it sounds a bit scary. So the first thing is, 2021, this happened, an executive order that basically said, bad things have happened, we have to fix this. And since then, there's been a lot of coming together of many people in the industry, the large companies and the foundations, the Linux Foundation, others are getting together, because what the executive order ordered, and remember this is not done by the White House going, I have an idea, it was all by consult, consult, consultation, was a whole bunch of thoughts about how we deal with it. So apart from agreeing we have a problem, there was this idea of going, 
well, like all governments do, we'll put rules in place. And we'll make it so that you can't sell software to the US government without passing these rules, right? which I'll touch on in a minute. But when you dig into the executive order, you start to see common patterns. So there are things like S-bombs, which I'll touch in a second, but look at the other words there. Look at automatic and integrity and evidence and demonstrations, right? The expectation is that you will have build processes and tools and, and everything around that that demonstrates that you are in control of the, the how you create software. What comes in, what you do with it, what you give out. And the S-bomb, which is the other bit that you will hear about if you haven't already, and there are two standards, well, at least two standards, Cyclone DX, which is an XML format, and SPDX, which is a different format, but it doesn't really matter. Right. An S-bomb, well, let me show you what an S-bomb is. Um, and the reason this is important, I said about scanning, right? When we're trying to scan, the scanning tools we use, they look at your final build and they track it and they go, what have you got? They investigate, they scan, they dig deep and they pull out stuff, right? And they try and figure out that you've got this version and that version depends on this other thing and, and so on. So they build a tree of dependencies. But that all depends on how visible that information is. Right? And you can imagine there's all sorts of ways to lose track of what version of some piece of code you've got. Right? That just goes on all the time. Right? So that carries on. So an S bomb says, let's not do it that way. Rather than, so rather than try and discover what we've got, which has problems, the S bomb inverts it. And the S bomb says, you will provide digitally signed proof of the dependencies and whatever else is required of the thing that you're giving to somebody else. And every component that you use has to also provide you with the same proof so that you can pass it on, okay? I hope that, that picture really shows that, okay. So that means that everything you have, every dependency you have breaks down into having an S-bomb, uh, digital signature, et cetera, et cetera. And it just gets bigger and bigger, right? So S-bombs, not that you have an S-bomb this big on your system, but an S-bomb is a, a URL to a digital proof of what your product, how your product was built and what's in it. And it then links out to other digital proofs to show you all the way down as far as we need to go to show you that we know exactly what you've got. And if you know exactly what you've got, then when a vulnerability turns up, you know that you've really got it. No scanning, no checking. It's guaranteed because you have a list of bill of materials of what you, what you used, and you have a vulnerability that says this thing, this version of this component is in your list. So you found it. The trouble is now, it means you'd have a lot more of those because now you have complete visibility of what you've got and therefore it means that every single vulnerability that's important to you, you're gonna know about, right? So effectively, that means the way that we create software is gonna change. So we've got executive pressure to be more rigorous in how we develop software and we're gonna find that if we can't automate and this stuff, we're not gonna get there. And we have to automate it, because if you think about to the, what I said about vulnerabilities being disclosed, vulnerability timing being negative, as soon as you know, you've probably already been exploited, so you need to shut the door. So you need to be able to press the button. And so we, we're gonna to move to a world where your build processes have to be very accurate, very fast. They have to start producing all this data, et cetera, et cetera. If you think about what that means to you as a developer, it means that your choices, the way that uh, you choose open source, has got to change. 
You often choose open source because of functionality. But now you've got to start thinking about choosing open source for different reasons. You think about what I said about them trying to target open source. How do you know that the dependency that you've chosen is good? Well, you've chosen it because it's got some functionality, and you've also chosen it because, because it's safe. How do you know it's safe? How many people here, how many people here download stuff on the internet? You know? Everybody? Okay. How many people here, uh, you're downloading, you've got to download, you put a dependency into your, into your POM, you download it. How many of you would maybe check the license? Anybody check the license of the thing you download? Oh, look. Oh, maybe. Okay. Would you check the license of the dependency of the dependency you've downloaded? No. That's where we're moving. Because you need to know this. And more than this, and, and I have so many more slides which I should show you, but I, um, I just want to cut to the end because I want to show you um, the important bit. We can't continue to do software development that, the way that we do now. The open source projects are being targeted, so if they're being targeted, we need to be more savvy in choosing them. So when you choose an open source project, you've got to start looking at whether or not it's a good project. Right. Actually, I'm going to flick back because I was going to show you something else. Just the last couple of slides. We are building with people like the Linux Foundation, the CNCF, and, and other foundations tools to help assess these open source projects for you. We're still working out what the rules are, but here's a couple that are coming up. There are more. Right? I've got, because um, we, run, we run Maven Central, we're looking at putting all sorts of analysis tools into Maven Central to make it available to you so that you as a developer can choose software more wisely. So not just because of the function or because of the license, but also because the open source project has a clean bill of health. That it's got the necessary security.md files, that maybe it's fulfilling all the requirements that the US government has placed upon it. Because if we don't get into control of these things, then we just let bad things come in. Right? So that's where I am with this. It's early days. Right? It really is early days. We're all talking it through. You as a developer need to think differently about this stuff and start thinking, what can you do? Start using these tools. Go look at them. Take a look at how your build system works and work out whether you can automate it. Look at, if you are involved in an open source project, have a good look at maybe who's allowed to press the build button. Can anybody build it? Do you use GitHub Actions? What do you do to make sure that that GitHub Action that you just picked is actually safe and hasn't been corrupted by the bad guys? Because they will. You as a developer are the ones who have to make these choices because you know what you're looking for. The IT guys, they'll run the tools that, that people say are the right tools, but they need your input to actually make the right choices. So I'm going to say, you know, developers, we've not been very good at changing our sports, but I hope to give you a little bit of a sense that you have to start thinking about this. You have to start getting clued up into what's coming. If you're very close to, if you are a company that provide, work for a company that provides stuff for, say, the US government, you're probably beginning to get aware of this already. But as developers, it's our responsibility to help make this work because we're the people who create the code, we're the people that choose the code. If we don't do things differently, it's not gonna get any different. And I think I will stop there. Thank you very much, are there any questions? Oh look, loads, go and shout. Um, yeah. Um, well, so what is there generally about code signing? Um, well, so the SBOM thing, sort of, the idea is when you've compiled your thing, you get an SBOM, which is this bill of materials. 
And in there will be some indication of like the source code you used. You know, and I'll wave my hands because it's all a bit fluffy, but it might be, I don't know, a GitHub checksum or something. But at the end of the day, that thing, that uh, SBOM is itself digitally signed, and the signature is then put a, a, is, is stored. The other term you'll hear is around is a thing called SIG store, signature stores. People are setting up SIG stores. So, because obviously, it's more than just, uh, here's my, here's my um, SBOM, and here's my public, here's my signature. You need to prove it. So you have to have a public key to access it and prove that you can do that. So where do you put that? And where do you put all the other stuff? So um, that's all ending up on these SIG stores. You will see Google started it. You will see other people start to create SIG stores because it will become an important part of it. But basically, yeah, everything, the theory is you should have a digitally proven track from the product that you've, that you've taken off the shelf all the way down to everything that's in it and so on and so on. I mean, in theory, but not yet, but in theory, the compilers you use, the dependencies of the compilers, all the way down to the source code. Um, so I will say there's one other thing, another thing you'll hear, and that's called reproducible builds. So the idea is that, and we realize that if I give you an SBOM, you should be able to reproduce it. You should be able to create the same environment and end up compiling it using the same tools and the same way and get exactly the same signature. And, and unfortunately, as we've all probably figured out, is quite often, if you do the same build twice, the binary is different because it's got like dates and things like that. And so there's another effort that's working on how we can make builds reproducible so that you can prove that the SBOM that you've got that that you can apply to take this source code and build it, you can prove, right? It's the close the circle. Does that answer the question? Or have I just rambled? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. A few years ago, I read a um, proof of concept where someone had engineered a GCC compiler that would inject exports into the code. And it would also detect if it was compiled in GCC and produce a compiler that injected exports, even though the injectable export code wasn't in the source code of the compiler. Has something like that actually been seen in the wild, or is it currently in security research or not near the I I can't tell you that I've seen that, but I have heard those stories and and we know that the other tools have been corrupted. Compilers are sort of pinnacle, I think, but other tools have been corrupted. But to be honest, right now, there's so many other ways of just easily corrupting you, just like giving you a Docker image or a GitHub action, because I'd even, it's not even like, how do I, the question is, how would I get you to use the compiler, right? And the simple answer is, I don't really have to, because quite often, all I have to do is go to your build process, and that last step where you do the zip, I'll get in there and I'll add some extra malware because you don't check, right? So there are these esoteric um, things knocking around, but in general, don't need to use them because we're all, you know, pretty much not, not we don't have any security in anything else. Yeah. The JavaScript requires um, jar searching to happen That's a, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, that should be reproducible. I don't know. Uh, good question. Don't know. Yeah. Cool. I tell you what, you can do it for me overnight and we'll chat about it tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, I'm around a week. If you have any more questions or you want to come and tell me that I didn't cover something or it wasn't clear, I'm around. Um, other than that, thank you so much for listening and... Wow, look, on time. Thank you. <laughs>